Então agora também agradecendo a presença do Greg Nojaim. O Greg Nojaim é diretor do Center for Democracy and Technology uh, nos Estados Unidos. Ele fica baseado em Washington. Uh, e o Greg é um expert em muitos assuntos uh, de política de internet. Uh, é sempre um prazer ouvi-lo falar. Uh, e a gente convidou o Greg para falar especificamente sobre um assunto uh, no qual ele tem trabalhado muito, uh, ele tem tido muita articulação e ouvido de todos os stakeholders a visão que eles têm a respeito disso, e é um assunto que tem aparecido bastante aqui no Congresso, uh, que é a cooperação jurídica internacional. Né? Então, a gente discutiu um pouco no painel da manhã uh, o formato, né, o arranjo jurídico uh, do, dos Emilates, né, esses acordos bilaterais de assistência judiciária internacional. E o Greg vai falar um pouco com a gente sobre o cenário internacional, propostas de reforma uh, e todo esse debate, como é que ele tem sido visto fora do Brasil. Então, agradecendo o Greg mais uma vez e passando a palavra para ele. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Greg Nojan. I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, I want to thank the Internet Lab for making it possible for me to come here. Um, Dennis, Francisco, Mariana, Jacqueline, the entire staff, really thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. I don't get many opportunities to talk to law students. It, it always um, energizes me because the students tend to have really good questions. I don't expect them. And, uh, and I find that a lot of fun. I see a lot of people who are not wearing um, earphones. Is it really the case that that many people understand English? How come we never see you in the street when we're looking for directions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, um, and I just want one more thank you, and that's a thank you for coming. You're in a wonderful city. There's a million things to do, and you came here. Thank you. Um, so, with that said, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my organization. I work at a human rights group, the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C. We have about 25 people. Roughly half of us are lawyers. Um, yes, we do hire interns, but we don't pay them. <laughs> so, but, but if you uh, um, are able to come to Washington and are interested in interning after I talk, come up afterwards and we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, uh, Rihanna was an intern at CDT 10 years ago. And look where she is. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, my piece of the puzzle as the Center for Democracy and Technology is to try to ensure privacy as against invasion by the government, or by other governments as well, not just the United States government. Our major initiative in the United States is to make the United States law, the statute, consistent with what the courts have said so far, which is that when law enforcement wants to get access to the contents of communications, it needs to get a court order, a warrant, based on a finding, a high finding of probable cause. That's one of our major initiatives. We've won that issue in the courts so far, uh, but we don't yet have it written into the law. Um, I'd like to say that the specialty of my organization is to bring people together from different backgrounds. Uh, and within our space, it's not about ethnic backgrounds or anything like that. It's about uh, law enforcement interests, the interests of companies, in the interests of consumers and in the interests of academics. Bring them all around a big table and deal with a very tough issue. And boy, we've got a lot of tough issues nowadays with new technology. Um, in, in this case, the difficult problem that I want to put in front of you is um, helping law enforcement, including law enforcement in Brazil, gain access to communications content including content held by U.S. companies um, while protecting the rights of Brazilians and Americans and other people around the world. Because the providers who um, hold this data have a worldwide user base. I'm not going to talk about the surveillance that Edward Snowden disclosed. I'm not going to do that unless you ask me about it. Um, the reason I'm not doing that is because it's a different kind of surveillance. It's under a whole different statutory scheme in the United States. Actually, 
there isn't a really good statutory scheme for that surveillance. It's very permissive, particularly with respect to people outside the United States. Um, if you ask me about it, and I hope you do, there are some major developments that I, want, that I could talk to you about. Instead, what I want to talk about is surveillance for criminal reasons. The Snowden surveillance was about national security. This is surveillance conducted to solve and prevent crimes. Um, and, and really, it's uh, the need to conduct the surveillance that law enforcement has is growing all the time. Um, and there are obstacles to it. Rihanna talked about one. It's encrypted communication. I'm talking about another, geography, dealing with the fact that the police often need access to data that is outside their country and um, 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 certainly remote from the scene of the crime that they are investigating. Um, this isn't news to you, but it was news to me. Uh, there's been a technological revolution. We've moved data from uh, from our desk drawers, from our homes, into computers, and then even out of computers and into the cloud. Now the data that law enforcement needs is held by third parties. It's held by companies like Google and Microsoft uh, and Facebook and Twitter. And they don't all hold data in the same way, and that creates some challenges for law enforcement. Uh, Microsoft. Microsoft is what I call a data localizer. When you sign up for a Hotmail account, Microsoft asks you, so, where are you? And they're asking you that because they're going to locate your data near you, often in your own country. Google, I don't think they ask that. They didn't ask that of me when I set up my Gmail account. Um, but um, Google is different. Google moves data around. Google is what I call a load balancer. They are moving data around on their network to balance the load. If things are busy in India, they might move data away from there um, to another place where it's less busy so they can balance the load on their network. Google also shards data. It, it divides data into different pieces so that even one email could be held in packets that are held in different places, different countries even. Um, so, um, uh, whereas uh, Microsoft is trying to hold data uh, on a static basis and it can live with a rule that talks about the location of the data as the basis for jurisdiction, for companies like Google that move data around, uh, it's not such a good rule, this idea of having location be determinative of jurisdiction. And for us individuals, one thing that we really like to know is where is our data, which might be something that is not answerable by a company that's moving data around like Google. But we also want to know what law is applying to the data. And um, we can't be sure of that uh, except to the extent the company tells us what law they are thinking applies to the data. That's for us. That's for the providers. For law enforcement, it's even harder. Uh, you've got a policeman here in Sao Paulo. He's trying to investigate a crime. He wants access to data that could be held in Seattle, Washington. It could be held in Silicon Valley. It could be somewhere else. It could be in Ireland. Um, but he needs access to that data to solve that crime. Uh, and sometimes he needs access to the data of people who are not Brazilians because the crimes that even local police are investigating nowadays can be um, conducted by people who are outside the country, not in the United States either, they're in France, they could be in China, they could be anywhere. Um, we have to deal with this problem. The criminals aren't going to wait, they're not going to not do their crimes while we figure out how to solve this problem, um, and, and we just can't keep waiting. Um, before I talk about what I think the solution space for the problem is, I want to talk a little about what the rules are that govern um, the surveillance right now. So each country has its own surveillance laws. And um, the, the reality is that because a lot of the large providers are in the United States, US law becomes relatively important in this area. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it requires 
and what it requires of the providers who operate under it. Uh, the law was written back in 1986. That was a long time ago. Uh, the most popular movie at the time, it was Top Gun. That movie with Tom Cruise. That shows you how long ago this was. They haven't really updated the law in a substantial way. There's been little tinkers along the way, but there's been no real effort to update the statute since it was written um, almost uh, 30 years ago. And it's, it was amazing to me. We had the same debate in the United States that Professor, I'm going to butcher his name, Sampaio Faraz, talk, Sampaio Faraz, that he talked about um, um, yesterday. We had the same debate. Um, is an electronic communication like an email? Is it like uh, a letter sent through the mail? Or is it like intercepting a communication um, through a wiretap? We had that exact same debate. And the debaters were probably the same types of people that were debating it here. We had uh, law enforcement, we had the privacy groups, uh, and we had the companies all trying to reach decisions about what rules would apply. In the U.S., we had a compromise. We always end up with compromises, but we had a compromise. And the compromise was this. For content that is probably not abandoned, that it's something that the person is probably going to want to use uh, in the future, we adopted a rule that said there needs to be a court order, it's called a warrant, based on a finding of probable cause, which is a very high level of proof. It requires a showing of a likelihood of crime and a likelihood that the information being sought will help solve that crime. Both of those prongs are required to get content in the United States. For, for non-content, for information about who you emailed and who emailed you, it's a lower standard. There's also a court order but you don't have to make that same uh, level of connection to the crime and that same level of certainty about a crime being uh, committed. For information that we call subscriber information, it was a lower standard still. Uh, this is information like who uh, had this IP address, this internet protocol address, on this day at this time. And that's relevant to a criminal investigation because it shows where you went uh, on the internet, who visited the page at, at that time. Uh, 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 information like, who belongs to this email address? Whose email address is this? That kind of information, you don't need a court order for under US law. Just a subpoena, that's a, a demand written up by law enforcement. Um, a subpoena will do the trick. So they wrote this. And, and I gotta say, the, the, the result was, it kind of makes sense. For the most sensitive data, you need the most evidence of crime, and you need a judge to sign off on it. For intermediate level sensitive data, traffic information, you need a judge to sign off on it, but you don't need the same level of proof. And for the less sensitive information, you don't need a judge, and you don't need a strong level of proof. So I, I think that that um, came out close to right, and it's very similar to the rules that have been adopted in Brazil. Uh, and it's similar to rules that are adopted in other countries. And one more thing, that rule about um, needing probable cause, it applies without discrimination. Um, if you're in the United States and uh, US law enforcement wants to investigate you, or they want to investigate me, it's the same rule for both of us. It's not discriminatory. Um, so, advance the clock from 1986 when there was no Google, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook to today. When all these um, companies that hold all this data exist and they have a global database. What did the Americans do? They took the law that had been written around a domestic rule and applied it to the international requests they were receiving. And other countries do the same thing. When a country wants access to, uh, 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 wants a physical search conducted in another country, they think there's evidence in this house 
in France and they want a search to be done of this house in France, they don't send their police officers across the border into France to search the house. They go to the French authorities with which they have a mutual legal assistance treaty and prevail on the French to search that house in France. Um, and uh, um, that's the way um, the Americans did it with um, data. They treated it like physical searches. There was not another regime to provide assistance. So when a, another government wants access to data held by a U.S. provider, the American government says to that government, uh, don't demand it of the provider, demand it of us. And we will apply on your behalf for a warrant under U.S. law to get this information. That's the way it had been working um, for uh, a number of years until, I think, fairly recently. So um, how does, how, how, what's that process actually look like? I'm the police officer in Sao Paulo. I want data that's held by uh, a U.S. company. I go to the central authority in um, Brazil, which was uh, represented here yesterday by Carolina Yuma de Sousa. Right? Um, they go to her and they say, help us get this data. And what does she do? She doesn't go to Google and say, give us the data. She might, but she shouldn't. She, she goes to the United States Department of Justice, our central authority, and she says, we want this data. And the Department of Justice says, well, if you want that data, give us what we need to go in front of a U.S. judge and prove probable cause. That's what's going on here. The um, most demands for these disclosures of content that fail, fail because of a failure to provide enough information to reach this probable cause threshold. Um, now, this is a, uh, in the United States, it is unlawful for uh, a U.S. provider to disclose content subject to U.S. jurisdiction to anyone absent a warrant issued by a U.S. judge based on a finding of probable cause. Now, uh, as Jacqueline has pointed out to me uh, more than a few times, but some of the providers are disclosing content to Brazilian authorities when they demand it. How can this be? Uh, I think that that's um, either because they are taking the position that the data that's being held is not under U.S. jurisdiction, if, they're a, if they are a Microsoft, they have localized data in Brazil, Microsoft will take the position that uh, Brazilian uh, process will reach it. Or if they're a company that moves data around, like a Google, they are probably taking the position that uh, there's a conflict of laws and under international law concepts of comedy, uh, that means uh, respect for different countries' laws, they do an analysis, and that the uh, Brazilian interest in the data exceeds the um, U.S. interest, and they make the disclosure that way. Now, in addition to this probable cause that's built in the U.S. law, there's other protections that are built in. Um, free expression. The Department of Justice in the United States will not <coughs> assist with a with demand for a disclosure, which if made um, to U.S. authorities, and it is being made, to U.S. authorities, right, because they're going in front of the judge, would violate a person's free expression rights. They require dual criminality so that um, there's no effort by the U.S. Department of Justice to assist with a prosecution of a crime of insulting a king in Thailand. And they get those requests. They turn them down. Uh, and, they, and they only uh, entertain requests for serious crimes crimes for which the punishment would be a year or more. Um, there was one case the Department of Justice likes to talk about where they received an MLAT request for a stolen chicken case. And they said, no, this is a stolen chicken. We're not going to uh, um, bother with it because it's just not enough. It's just not important enough to put in the resources. Enough information is given to the judge. The judge applies for the warrant. I'm sorry, if enough information is given to the Department of Justice, it applies for the warrant from a judge. The judge grants the warrant. The warrant goes to the provider, 
the provider makes the disclosure to the Department of Justice of the United States, the Department of Justice of the United States removes the irrelevant data and turns it over to the Central Authority in Brazil. The Central Authority, I'm going too fast. The Central Authority in Brazil discloses it to the Sao Paulo policemen on average 10 months after he made the request. He's grown a long beard waiting for this data to show up for an internet crime that he's investigating. Um, it doesn't take a, a scientist to know that's not, that's not a system that's going to work. Um, in addition, that um, policeman in Sao Paulo who wants this data, this whole system is opaque to him. It's opaque. Uh, he can't see through it. He doesn't know if the data is coming. He doesn't know when it's coming. And it's very frustrating um, for him um, to do this. On the, on the U.S. side, it's, it's an expensive thing. It costs money to hire the prosecutor who goes in front of the judge, got to hire the judge too, and to, and to gather the data and to, and to make these disclosures. It takes time and it takes money. And you know what? Those prosecutors who are receiving these requests from the Central Authority in the United States, they have other things to do. They do. There are big local crimes that, are, that need to be solved, and then if they aren't solved, they threaten the career of the prosecutor. So he's got 100 cases. One of them's from Brazil. 99 of them are from local. Which one is he going to prioritize? Which ones are he going to prioritize? And that's the way it's been working. Um, uh, they just haven't put in the resources and the person power to process the requests that they're getting on, on a timely basis. The United States receives more than 3,000 MLAT requests a year abroad. I'm sorry, and it, it receives more than 3,000 MLAT requests each year, and it makes about 1,000 MLAT requests itself. When you look at the big picture here, what the United States is essentially doing is exporting its own law. Right? It's getting these requests, it's applying U.S. rules to the requests that are coming in from the rest of the world. It means that for uh, a country like Brazil, where digital evidence becomes harder to obtain than perhaps it should, but you know what? It also means for countries like Russia and China, digital evidence becomes harder to obtain, and it probably should be. It probably should be, because the way the U.S. system is working, it is closing down requests that can be used to persecute people, to persecute dissenters. Those demands are simply not met in this system. So it does serve a, a valuable human rights a protective function. And when I think about solutions that solve problems, that make it easier for the prosecutor in Brazil to get data, I'm also thinking about the person in China and the person in Russia who might need some protection from a, a, an MLAT system that works. So. Uh, before we get to the solutions, I want to mention one other thing. I've been talking so far just about the disclosure of content. The non-content rules in the United States, they're very different. As I said, you don't have to meet probable cause, but you know what else? The non-content rules, they don't apply to governmental demands when the government is a foreign government. Hear this, under U.S. law, if uh, there's a demand for traffic data, who emailed whom, if that demand comes from Brazil or any other country, a U.S. provider can disclose that information voluntarily. If that demand comes from the U.S. government, they cannot. They can't. They have to, they have to tell the U.S. government, you go get a court order, even though we can disclose this data to every other government in the world, the US government needs a court order. To my mind, that's screwy. That needs to be changed. It shouldn't be the case that 
Uh, and, and, and the data that can be disclosed, it's not just data of non-Americans. If the government of Brazil comes to the, uh, 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 Google to get my Gmail, Google can disclose the, the to-from information to the government of Brazil. They couldn't do that to the American government. They could do it to any other government. That, that seems uh, something that should be fixed as well. Well, um, I've described a problem. It's a big one. It's not going to last, though, because uh, I think all the players in the system believe it needs to be fixed. Um, criminal investigations, they're too important to public safety, and they're being stymied. Uh, it's unfair to providers who are stuck in the middle between competing legal regimes. I mean, people like to say uh, about these, it's hard to have a lot of sympathy about a billion dollar company, but they really are made up of real people. Um, they're, they have employees, they have families, and when they get put in jail for not complying with a request, it's a big deal. And um, I think that we have to account for that as well. It's unfair to us consumers too, because we don't know what rules apply to our data. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three of the solutions that I think are progressing along more than the others that have been talked about. These are not things at the um, discussion forum level. They are more things that I think are real and are moving toward um, um, fruition. Uh, and they kind of fall into two categories. One is what I call the brute force solutions, and the other is the collaborative legal solutions. And you'll never guess which ones I'm going to favor. Uh, it's the collaborative ones. The, the brute force uh, solutions, you know, um, some Brazilian judges uh, are engaging in some of these. Uh, they include arresting executives of providers who fail to comply uh, with demands, even if there is a competing um, legal regime. Uh, they are uh, solutions like closing down services, like WhatsApp. They are compelled data localization. That's another brute force um, solution, which uh, Marco Seville has rejected in large part. Uh, government hacking, uh, which Rihanna talked about a little bit, which is governments hacking into services because they can't get the data through other legal means, so they um, use their own uh, means to, to, to get the data. And the final um, brute force is um, compelling backdoors to encryption, which again Rihanna talked about. All those solutions have downsides. Uh, if you uh, compel backdoors, you make everybody less secure because you uh, make a backdoor for the bad guys as well. If the government uh, is hacking into um, email, it's sending you uh, a message saying, click here, you think it's from a friend, and it turns out it's the government trying to get your data to install malware on your device. Uh, too much of that, and people aren't going to um, trust the internet anymore, any more than they do now. Um, compelled data localization hurts startups, and it's inefficient. It makes it harder for particularly um, voice-based um, services to function. So what we prefer are more collaborative legal solutions. What are the goals of these solutions? Uh, first, to protect rights, rights to privacy, rights to free expression, and not to facilitate disclosures to violators of rights or to cases where uh, the prosecution itself is a violation of rights. Uh, our solutions have to facilitate law enforcement access, and it has to be at scale. And the scale is going to be as large today, and it's going to be immense going forward. Uh, most crimes, I think, will be investigated based on digital evidence as we move forward. It's got to be fast, it's got to be clear, and it's got to be fair um, uh, at the country level. There has to be reciprocity, meaning if um, uh, one country is required to live by um, particular rules, well then those rules have to be good for other countries as well. The, the three solutions that are kind of meeting these uh, criteria that are being discussed right now are also grouped into three different types of groups. There's bilateral agreements between countries, which in my view is probably the most promising in the short term. There's multilateral approaches, and then there's what I call the Club of Nations approach. Okay? Um, for the bilaterals, uh, what's going on in the United States, this idea is starting to catch on, 
is the notion that the United States would lift this block in U.S. law, which prohibits the providers from disclosing information to requesting countries, lift that block if the requesting country meets a series of human rights-based criteria. So, um, this would this would supplement, but not supplant, mutual legal assistance treaties. So, um, the, the way this would work would be, there'd be a statute adopted in the United States. It would say, this requirement of probable cause, it doesn't apply when there is a, uh, an agreement between the two countries that permits the demand, okay? And each country entering into these agreements would do it um, voluntarily, evaluating the other country's laws and saying to itself, do we think these laws meet good, strong human rights standards? Um, what, what should those, and I, I should say there's certain advantages to this bilateral approach. First, it, it deals with what I call the Russia problem. Um, Russia has um, probably a poor human rights record when it comes to prosecuting people, but it also needs to solve crimes. And so you've got to have a system that allows for the Russians to get data. Uh, this idea um, of a bilateral agreement, there wouldn't be one between the United States and Russia. The Russians would go through the MRAT system and it would be the responsibility of the US government to uh, turn down the request that seemed like a violation of rights. Uh, but another country, uh, for example, uh, a Brazil or a United Kingdom, they might be able to make the, um, to get the agreement and make the direct demands of providers. Um, and the way I'm looking at this as a human rights advocate is that this is an opportunity to raise standards for um, surveillance demands. We're looking at things like building into the US law a requirement of um, due process. There'd have to be basic trial rights from in the country making the demands. Uh, no torture, no cruel and inhumane treatment. Um, there'd have to be a strong factual basis for the demand, factual basis for the crime, and to believe that the information about the crime would be there in the data being sought. Independent authorization, preferably by a judge. Um, particularity, which is kind of a proportionality concept. No bulk collection under these uh, bilateral agreements. There ought to be notice so that if your data is demanded and um, uh, it's given up, you get notice. It, it can happen after the fact, but at least you would get notice. Um, um, certain transparency requirements so that people would know how often this power was being used. And also a credible process for choosing which countries um, would um, have these bilateral agreements. Um, the United States, as I think I mentioned, has already negotiated one of these treaties. It's been negotiated with the United Kingdom. It can't come into effect yet because the U.S. law that would clear the way for these agreements has not yet been um, introduced or passed. Um, and there's going to be a fight uh, about what the standards are um, for these uh, agreements. And uh, we're going to be trying to get the strongest standards that we can. You know, for the UK, uh, until last year, the United Kingdom did not require a judicial officer to issue warrants for content. It was all done at the level of the uh, Home Secretary, who is the uh, equivalent of the Chief Prosecutor in the country. They changed their law um, under pressure from privacy groups in the UK and under pressure from the United States, which wanted to have an agreement with them, like I just described, so that the prospect of, of having one of these agreements helped the UK come to the conclusion that it needed to have judicial involvement in the issuance of its warrants. When I think about these bilateral agreements, I think, well, what countries will want them? Brazil will want one. And then I ask myself, and I'll be asking civil society groups in Brazil, what are the holes in Brazilian law that ought to be plugged, that ought to be dealt with uh, in this process so that Brazil could get one of these agreements? 
and what one goal that I understand exists is that there's a good strong standard, we know what it is, when law enforcement here wants access to information in real time, a wiretap, but that the standard for stored data is perhaps not so clear. Maybe there could be some clarification that would be Brazil's ticket to one of these uh, agreements. That's how I'm looking at these things. Um, what's the status of this uh, legislation, of this idea? Uh, there was a hearing in, at the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee last week. The idea of bilateral agreements was well received. Uh, the committee chairman uh, expressed an interest in having legislation by year end. I think that's very ambitious. Um, and the other body would also have to act the House. Uh, and I think we're looking at an 18-month timeline or something like that. Another option is what I call the multilateral approach. And this is coming um, mostly from Europe. It would be a protocol to an existing convention called the Budapest Cybercrime Convention, to which Brazil is not a party. Uh, but it could be a party to the protocol, even though it's not a party to the treaty itself. This treaty uh, was negotiated mostly among European countries, um, and it mostly applies to European and North American countries. It governs with a light touch access to data across borders. It's mostly about process, not power. The protocol um, could well be about power. Many of the um, civil liberties advocates around the world have criticized the Budapest Convention because it doesn't pay enough attention to human rights, ensuring that the demands that it facilitates uh, respect human rights. The protocol could worsen the problem, uh, but we don't yet know what the um, parameters for this protocol will be. There's to be an announcement sometime in mid-June, that's next month, about what the parameters for the <coughs> protocol will be, and uh, their goal is to adopt one uh, within the next few years. And finally, another approach is what I call the Club of Nations approach. Um, it's being discussed at the EU uh, at a meeting on June 8th uh, of the, the Justice and Home Affairs Ministers of the member states. Uh, they're going to be discussing making production orders issued in one member state in the EU um, binding in another state provided that state is given notice. Uh, they're also discussing um, non-binding options and they're also looking beyond the 12 of nations that are in the European Union toward multilateral and bilateral approaches. So what I'd like to leave you with is, is just this thought. Um, there are options, these brute force options, that uh, are being uh, exercised by some countries. I think they are um, not healthy for the internet. Um, and there is a prospect for, I think, other solutions that are bilateral, multilateral, or group of nations that could work uh, to serve the interests of law enforcement, of human rights advocates and of the providers that have to live with that, whatever decisions are made. Thanks much. I look forward to your questions. Agradecer a palestra do Greg Nojain, que de uma forma tão didática é, ofereceu aí um panorama geral de quais são as questões que estão postas nessa discussão sobre assistência judiciária internacional. Eu acho que foi um ótimo complemento para o painel de hoje de manhã, em que a gente discutia essas dificuldades do ponto de vista do Ministério da Justiça e aqui no Brasil, e agora a gente pode ouvir um pouco mais de como é essa situação nos Estados Unidos. Eu vou abrir para perguntas, então quem tiver perguntas, por favor, já se manifeste, mas eu vou exercer a minha prerrogativa de estar na mesa e fazer uma pergunta eu mesmo. É, ao longo da, da, da exposição, e essa é uma, 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 um argumento, um, um diagnóstico que a gente ouve uh, quando fala sobre esse assunto, uh, é recorrente a, a, a ideia de que há pouco interesse uh, por parte do Departamento de Justiça nos Estados Unidos de reformar uh, esse sistema, de investir mais dinheiro, capacitar mais pessoas, uh, de fato é um sistema caro, de fato uh, há claramente uma uh, 
necessidade de priorização dos casos a serem investigados nos Estados Unidos e não casos internacionais. É, na sua opinião, o que poderia gerar ou despertar algum interesse ah, por parte do governo americano em talvez ah, investir mais nessa solução ou reformulá-la de forma a atender às expectativas e às demandas de autoridades de outros países. Então, ah, é a pressão por empresas americanas que tem que ser feita no, no governo americano, já que as suas subsidiárias em outros países estão passando por pressões diferentes e momentos né, com essas medidas drásticas. Como essas medidas drásticas se repercutem no governo, então quando tem, por exemplo, um bloqueio de um aplicativo como o WhatsApp, isso repercute em algum interesse maior ah, por parte do governo de reformar esses, esses sistemas ou há algum tipo de, de estratégia ah, que pode ser empreendida para que é, aumente o interesse ah, nesses tipos de, de, de mecanismos dos Estados Unidos? Well, that's, that's a really good question. So, I, I think that actually the problem is less with the Department of Justice and more with the U.S. Congress. It's partly with the Department of Justice because they could prioritize um, um, foreign demands higher than domestic demands. That's very hard for them to do um, just because of the pressures that they're under. To their credit, the Department of Justice asked... <coughs> To their credit, they've done two things. First, they asked Congress, okay, um, let's centralize the processing of MLAT requests from foreign governments. When the MLAT request comes into the Department of Justice, give us the ability to go in front of a judge in Washington, D.C., as opposed to having to go out to California or Washington State or Chicago. Uh, let us process it in Washington, D.C. We'll build up a cadre of really smart prosecutors, and they'll go in front of a judge who is really experienced in dealing with these MLAT requests from, from other governments, and we'll do it all in Washington. And uh, they got statutory authority to do that, but they didn't get the money that they asked for to do it. So Congress said, yeah, go ahead, great idea, DOJ, but we're not going to give you more money to do it. We're not going to give you more people, and we're not, we're just not going to ask you to spend your money elsewhere. So to me, that's a, a problem of the Congress as opposed to of the Department of Justice. They could do things that I, I consider um, small helps, but they would, I think, make the world a little better for um, the the policeman in Sao Paulo who's grown that long beard and is investigating this crime, um, they could uh, adopt a, an electronic filing system that would better prompt uh, the uh, foreign law enforcement to provide the information needed to meet the U.S. standards. Uh, they could um, have a tracking system so that the policeman who's wondering is my MLAT request going to be granted, would know where it stands in the process. Uh, they could even give an estimate of how long it, they think it will take for that MLAT to be processed. Um, they could report numbers. They don't even report numbers on a, on a, on a, a regular basis. The numbers that I gave you were reported just to support their request for more money. Uh, I don't have an annual report from them on the numbers of MLAT requests they make or the numbers that they receive. Uh, and there is not a public accounting of the size of the backlog. Uh, we know the backlog is thousands of MLAT requests, but they don't report it. We don't know what those numbers are. So I think there's some things they could do, but they're not going to solve the big problem. Perguntas? Temos perguntas? É, boa noite, meu nome é Pedro, eu sou estudante de Direito também, mas eu faço lá na PUC. E você falou muito sobre é, cooperação internacional e etc. É, só que eu queria, por um lado, Dá, perguntar a para você cortar sobre os outros dois no que você queria falar e também perguntar sobre é, o Patriot Act que permitiu aliás, permite que o governo americano 
faz interceptações com um processo legal é, diferente do, do que você mencionou. E eu quero saber como ele funciona, esse processo, pelo Patriot Act, e como ele pode ser usado para, tipo, é, atacar ativistas e pessoas como o Snowden. So the USA Patriot Act um, was enacted right after the attacks of 9-11. And um, it, it, has, it has a number of different provisions that um, a lot of them are not really relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, some of the more objectionable provisions of Patriot Act related to immigrants. And, um, There was a provision that allowed the government to detain a person who was coming to the United States for seven days without any explanation, uh, which um, is not uh, permitted um, under the Constitution. Um, other provisions, uh, I don't remember one that specifically went after uh, dissenters. Do you, Rihanna? Um, Uh, what a lot of what it did was loosen um, the rules around um, surveillance. It enacted um, one of the statutes, Section 215, which um, um, was the authority for some of the disclosures that Edward Snowden made. Uh, they were the disclosures about uh, uh, the collecting of phone records in the United States. Um, but I, I think. The Patriot Act, compared to um, this other statute that I promised I wouldn't talk about, but I'm going to talk about now, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, it's really uh, not that uh, impactful on people outside the United States. There was this other statute that um, was enacted, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Section 702 of that statute. It's the one that authorizes the government to surveil people outside the United States without a court order, without any warrant, uh, and based on uh, just the collection of information relevant to foreign policy, that statute actually expires at the end of this year. It's going to get reauthorized, and we're in a fight about what reforms the statute will undergo in connection with this reauthorization debate. And um, one major development that happened just last week was uh, 30 of the largest tech companies in the United States got behind a substantial reform agenda. And the most substantial piece of it is to say that this surveillance can only be conducted for good reasons, uh, like to prevent terrorism, uh, to prevent sabotage, espionage, uh, attacks on US forces and allied forces, So it really was, uh, I thought, um, an important um, statement from some of these tech companies. You know, we civil liberties groups, we're going to say this all the time, but to have the tech companies come out and say the same thing, it was very useful and I think will be important to this debate. Mais alguma pergunta? Acho que a gente tem tempo para mais uma pergunta. Arthur. Um, boa noite, meu nome é Arthur Pericles, eu sou estudante de mestrado aqui na faculdade. Minha pergunta é, tem a ver mais com o assunto do que eu estava discutindo. Eu queria saber o que você pensa sobre o problema da coleta de dados é, na, nas fronteiras, né? quando as pessoas estão chegando de avião nos Estados Unidos, a nova política é, a respeito disso, de exigir que as pessoas é, desbloqueiem os, os celulares para que os agentes de imigração possam examiná-los. Obrigado. You know, it, it, it affects um, um, non-citizens who are visiting the United States. It makes them less likely to visit. There are conferences that have been moved outside the United States because of um, those uh, requirements. 
um, it, and it also chills people's use of the very communications tools that, that have made them more productive and more um, integrated into, into society. I, I really think it's a, it's a disastrous move for the United States, and I'm really worried that other countries are going to follow. Um, and it doesn't apply just to non-citizens coming in. For citizens, um, when we are at the border, we don't have the same constitutional rights. We have the same rights, but there are more exceptions built into them as we're entering the United States. My company has required all of its international travelers to delete their email accounts before returning to the United States. We reinstall them once we get in, but we have to delete them when we come in. And the idea is that we don't want the government to have access to our communications, even though we're not doing anything wrong. And, and um, it, I gotta say, as, a, as an American, it really hurts me to, to think that it's my government doing this to me, and that there's not a lot that, uh, that can be done about it. There, there are challenges that are pending to this, and I know um, uh, the, elect the Electronic Frontier Foundation is actively looking for more cases. Uh, I don't know exactly where they're going to go, but I, 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 uh, uh, I anticipate that this problem is going to get worse. Uh, uh, because we've got uh, Mr. Trump talking about extreme vetting. Uh, his first uh, order on extreme vetting was held up by the courts. So was his second order. Um, but uh, they're looking for more and more ways to do it, and they're looking uh, at social media passwords as, a, as one of the things that they might demand. Quero mais uma vez agradecer ao Greg uh, e pedir uma salva de palmas para 